Denny Gule. Yes, there are organizations who probably did not have much preparedness or seriousness, managed, got somewhere. If those organizations now want to do something more formal, more structured, more sustainable, what would you suggest they should go about doing and how? To me, uh, 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 organizational resilience um, uh, is only one type of resilience. Uh, there is also personal resilience. Okay, and community resilience. Um, those three types of resilience are interrelated in a very complex relationship. But they are, okay? Uh, make no mistake about it, okay? If, how can you uh, have organizational resilience if your people are not resilient, okay? If you have, are an organization um, uh, that is within a community and detached from the community, how can you afford to, how can you say your resilience? Community has to be resilient too. Okay. And, and when I'm talking about community, I'm not talking about the village, although it could be the village, but it's the city, it's the province, it's the state, it's the country, okay? That's the community. Uh, and even some community are uh, across boundaries and, and do not, don't take, understand what boundaries are. So different type of community also. But what you need to do is to, um, help with the resilience of your own people, help with the resilience of the community, work with them. Uh, it's been happening in, in organization, more and more organization, there's a trend, okay? Uh, a lot of it was done in uh, uh, cities, cities like uh, Boston, New York, Toronto, London, uh, 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 and, and Tokyo, and, and uh, all over the world, okay, there was a chief resident officer, um, over a hundred. Oh. And then their role was to tie everything up together, mm. okay, all the needs that, a good example, uh, they needed to, to build a dike, okay, in a city, okay, just a little bit more, you can have a cycle path. Uh, this is the place, they had a problem with uh, flooding. They also had a problem with uh, parking space in the city. And then they also had a problem with green space in the city, which was insufficient. Guess what they did? Okay. Um, I've seen a city where they were building a dike and an organization uh, uh, lent uh, engineers to help them with the dike. They did not send people to dig and to, but they provided free of charge engineers. And you know what? That dike will prevent flooding that would affect the company. Okay. It makes sense, okay? They uh, carved out in the city a nice park, okay, under which there was parking space. And at the bottom of it, there was a reception uh, place for the excess water coming in. Wow. Nice. This uh, company in the Netherlands, they gave 100 euros uh, to employees to buy a bicycle. Those in living within five kilometers. In exchange, they had to abandon their parking spot at the office. You see? <laughs> so, <clears throat> healthier employees, because they were doing exercise, the company was saving money, okay? At the end of the day, that's a good, that's a good point of resilience, okay? And, and uh, uh, free bus passes in the hotels for customers. You go there, and it was floored. I mean, I paid for my room, and they gave me uh, keys and bus passes. And bus passes for it, well, to go to the city, wherever you want, and so on, and so on, and so on. You see, just one solution that covers all these aspects, and that's what the chief resilience officer does, okay? So you could have something similar in organizations also, uh, and I thought it was, that's just neat, that's kind of neat. That's kind of nice to, to, to have this kind of thinking and putting all these things together instead of everyone working on their little project on, on, and fighting for budgets uh, with one another. We're not putting it all together, and they actually save money because they were doing it all at the same time. Okay? So there's a lot of good reasons to take that approach of the chief resilience officer.